Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and in this episode, I'll be speaking with Michael Lawfer. Michael is a mathematician and university professor who has turned his attention to do-it-yourself pharmaceuticals, creating and disseminating open-source plans for low-cost alternatives to expensive medical treatment. He is the chief spokesperson for the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective, and he received a lot of media attention in 2016 after creating a $30 DIY alternative to the EpiPen, which is 10 times cheaper than they could be purchased for. His work has been featured by Scientific American, the IEEE, Vice, CNN, and more. We discuss the future of healthcare, information as power, and subversion. It's time once again for your frequent disclaimer that the thoughts of the guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Future Grind or myself. As you'll hear in this episode, Michael and I have some fundamental philosophical differences, but he does a great job of defending his positions and made me think harder about some of these very important questions. And that's the goal of this. Also, a word of warning. In this episode, we discuss the production and potential use of homemade pharmaceuticals. Ingesting any of these compounds should be considered extremely dangerous, and things can go wrong. I advise consulting with a trained medical doctor and seeking expert opinions before taking your health care into your own hands. As always, show notes and more are available at futuregrind.org, where on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook, YouTube, and DTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. This is Future Grind. Michael. Michael, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. I'd love to start this off by hearing what you do in your own words. What is the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective and what is its purpose? We work to develop open source tools that allow people to manufacture their own medicines. This is important work because it allows people to seize access to health technologies to which they would otherwise not have access because of either price or legality or lack of infrastructure. How did you decide on the name, Four Thieves Vinegar Collective? Well, it's a, it's a historical reference. During the plague times, there was a group of four thieves who were brothers, and they went through plague-ridden villages stealing and burgling. And they kind of had the run of things because there was no law enforcement there. The independent places that would have tried to track down thieves, there was no infrastructure for that. Nobody wanted to go near plague-ridden areas. And nobody could quite figure out who these people were who didn't mind going into plague-ridden areas. And eventually they were caught and they were offered the option of either the death penalty or revealing how it was that they managed to go through these plague-ridden villages without catching the plague. And they decided to tell everyone their secret. And it was that they had an herbalist for a mother who probably would have been part of the stake as a witch if they had found her. Um, But they had been taught about how to use herbal decoctions in vinegar as essentially an antibiotic. I imagine they took it internally as well as applying it topically, but they would scrub up with it and they would take it internally and they they managed to stay healthy. The wonderful thing about this story is that merely because of the spread of information, untold numbers of lives were saved. So feeling a somewhat spiritual kindred ancestry with anything that had a spread of information saving lives, that uh, that was the inspiring story that gave us the name. This is described as a collective, and you allude to others, but you seem to be the only name and face openly associated with this organization. How large is your team, and what are the types of people that are working with you? 20-some-odd people we have, roughly. An anarchist collective is, by definition, a fairly loose organization, so people participate more or less as their regular lives allow 
you know, everybody has a day job and some people have families and other obligations and people throw in as they can. Some people are more publicly associated. Some people are very, very security conscious to the point where I don't know their real names or where they live. We communicate via an encrypted net platform called Semaphore. It's like Slack, but it's end-to-end encrypted. And we have a lot of different people because there are a lot of different moving parts uh, that, that go into our work. So we have people who are health professionals, doctors, nurses. We have chemists. We have people who are hardware programmers, software programmers, hardware designers, additive technology experts. You know, and, and then there's me who basically deals with publicity. <laughs> Is there anyone else that is open about their participation that you would like to highlight? I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd like to highlight. If, if, they, if they decide they want to be in the limelight, that's, that's up to them. But I, I, I try not to drag anybody into the, into the spotlight. I, I do that very pointedly because while we haven't drawn a lot of animosity yet, I think it's only a matter of time before we're – become more vilified by certain personages who won't appreciate what we're doing. And I've tried to structure things very much so that I can bear that blow so that the rest of the collective doesn't have to. That makes complete sense. What is your background and how did you end up getting involved with this world? Uh, My background's in mathematics and high energy physics and, you know, general science as well. But I was, I've always worked in human rights. I was, I was raised by activists. And when I went away to graduate school, I, I was part of a group that visited Nicaragua and El Salvador. And we were visiting various places just to look at the state of the infrastructure down there to try and see what was needed and how things could be made better in those sort of second world countries. And in El Salvador, there was a particular town that we visited in in relative detail where some other members of this human rights group had worked to build up some infrastructure for them. They built them a school and they built them a small medical clinic. And when I went in, the whole group went in. We had a tour of the medical clinic, and the doctor in attendance was was very congenial and showed us what they had and what they were capable of. At the end, the rest of the group left, and I stayed, and I asked the doctor, I said to her, what isn't working? You showed us everything that's working. Tell me what, what you lack. And she said, we don't have any birth control. And I kind of couldn't believe it because in terms of essential medicines, it's about as essential as you get. And I said, how is that possible? And she said, we ran out three months ago. (laughs) I mean, I was absolutely dumbstruck. I said, how is that possible? This is a socialist country. Can't you call the main national hospital in San Salvador and ask for more? And she said, we did. And they said, no tenemos tampoco. Like, we don't have any either. And, and then I really couldn't believe it. I was, I was absolutely, I was, I was just stunned. This is a really old technology, a really critical technology, one of the most basic, I would argue, probably at the top of the list. Because when looking at, at, at health rights, reproductive rights certainly come first. And I just thought, God, this is so bizarre. And, and here's a country that has underground labs for, you know, cooking meth and ecstasy and crack like it's it's not that much more sophisticated from a technical standpoint to make birth control why not just make birth control and that was the seed of the idea that 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 started everything you're another example of someone who has been inspired by experiences had while traveling we get quite a few of those on this podcast and it seems to be a theme that runs through many of the episodes so you're a doctor but you're a doctor of mathematics. So where does your interest and training and knowledge in the medical side of things come from? Are you self-taught? I mean, yeah. Or if if you want to be slightly less generous, you know, I'm not trained (laughs) to strictly speaking. I have a decent knowledge base, but that's that's been developed by talking with a lot of experts and being referred to a lot of literature and spending a lot of time looking at all of that. But having a science background 
makes navigating scientific literature a little easier. But it's something that anybody can do. And I think that's really important. It takes a little bit of getting used to to be able to read a scientific paper. But once you do, it's just like learning to read or learning to navigate any other medium. Once you have that literacy, it offers you a tremendous amount of access. And they really should teach courses in how to read a scientific paper and in schools. Right now, I'm recording this in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, which is home to the global headquarters of Mylan Pharmaceuticals. In 2016, Mylan faced public outcry after they raised the price of their EpiPens to over $600 for a two-pack. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. These EpiPens are epinephrine auto-injectors used for the emergency treatment of anaphylaxis and are potentially life-saving tools for people facing severe allergic reactions. These drastic price increases literally put lives at risk. And in response to this, you released an instructional video on how to make your own epinephrine auto-injector, which you referred to as the EpiPencil. This has a total cost of around $30, over 10 times cheaper than the pharmaceutical companies were charging. Do you know of any examples of your EpiPencil having been used in a real-world situation? You know, it's so funny. So many people ask me that uh, when I do interviews. And at this juncture, I don't. And there's a there's a very specific reason why not. For a very long time, I, I would say until very, very recently, or even up until now, we've worked very hard to distance ourselves from people who might or might not be using the technology we've developed. The reason for that is an ethical one. We don't want to be seen as trying to push the technology to say, oh, people should be using this. The whole point of all of the work that we do is to offer people a choice that they should make independently. To say, here's an option so that you're not left with a singular option, which is either use it or don't. We offer technologies where if you're not interfacing with the traditional infrastructure, you have options that you can explore independently. We didn't want to be, and we continue to not want to be, something that merely supplants that sort of an infrastructure to say, oh, come play with this team instead. But instead to say, this is independent, this is a personal choice, this is something you can decide on your own, and here it is if you want it. So we worked very hard to distance ourselves from people who might be using it. We didn't try to find out if people were building them. We didn't track downloads. We didn't track visits to the website even. I imagine a lot of that will still stay in place, but we are going to become a little more involved with some of our users potentially, where we'll offer more directed guidance if people get in touch and want to dialogue with us more specifically. We've done that to a limited degree, but we're starting to feel like more is needed right now. Recently, YouTube removed your EpiPencil video from their platform, say saying that it violated their policy on, quote, harmful or dangerous content. Yeah. It's worth noting that videos from other channels that are based on your work, such as Nerd Rage's build of the device based on your instructions, are still hosted. What do you make of this? So Nerd Rage was actually a member of the collective for a while, and he put that up when we were all working on it. Here's the difference. Nerd Rage is very respectful of the type of liability requirements that institutions like YouTube try to institute. Say, oh, his video is fraught with disclaimers saying, don't try this at home, this is for informational purposes only, or however he phrased it. While the work that we do doesn't do that, I don't make any apology or say, oh, you know, be careful, don't listen to anything I say. I'm really out there as spokesperson for the collective to merely say, look, here's a tool. We know it works. Here's how we know. Go use it or don't. Make your choice. And it, I think it really speaks to the culture of fear that seems to proliferate our society, American culture in particular, so much because instead of saying, oh, let's let something that might save a bunch of people out there, it's like, well, it might save a bunch of people, but if 
heaven for friends, something were to go wrong, then it would be our fault. Let's make sure we don't get sued, which I think is terribly childish and disappointing. So we're now having the video hosted on the Internet Archive as well as the Alexandria Project. Yeah, that's something I deal with as well with this podcast. Many of the guests that are interviewed here are interested in human augmentation and are involved with self-experimentation. This is dangerous, so I make it a priority to be very clear about expressing that danger. I want people to have the knowledge and access to make decisions about their bodies, but I also want to do the best I can to make sure that those are informed decisions and that precautions are being taken. However, I have to make an assumption that there are people in this audience that, due to a mental state or due to a substance that they may be under the influence of, or a number of other reasons, are unable to make a rational decision. Oh, careful, 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 my friend. (laughs) You have to be very cautious when you get into that world and say people who can't make rational decisions for themselves because then you're left with this very sharp ethical differentiation. So in one case, you can say we put information out there and we trust people to make their own decisions. And what people decide to do with their own bodies and with their own lives is their business. And information is good. And more information is better. It can help people be more informed to make better informed decisions. If, on the flip side, you decide that some people can't, then there becomes this classist stratification of those of us who are worthy of making decisions for everybody else and decide what is acceptable for people to do or know or have access to. And ultimately, that's the very problem that our movement was trying to fight against when we started. And I think it's very sad to see so many people who are and have been so innovative in this realm fall victim to the same rhetoric that they were fighting when they started this. I can totally understand where you're coming from here. These are extremely hard questions that we as a society have to deal with, and any decision that we make is going to be a controversial one. We know that there are things that can manipulate our psychology, and that we are not as in control of the choices we make as we might like to think. But a lot of this hinges on the question of free will. Does it even exist? I tend to think it doesn't. And we don't need to dive into that now, but I do think that it's relevant here. Well, assuming we have free will, as a right, we should allow people to exercise it. And I think that that's, if, if, if people don't believe that, I think that, you know, they can go hang out with their fascist friends and, and I'd like it if they'd leave me alone. Yeah, whether I agree with it or not, the assumption of free will is important in society, and I don't see an easy way around that at this point. So, many people like to talk about the drug synthesis instructions that you make available, but I think the most important part of your work might be the Apothecary Microlab, your open source automated lab reactor, which can be built with off the shelf parts for around $100. The Four Thieves website says that this will save hundreds of thousands of lives. Tell me more about this. What can this do? Well, we hope it'll save a bunch of lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's yet to be seen how effective it'll be or how many people will have the will to adopt it. But old school wet chemistry, the sort of thing that gave rise to a lot of the basic pharmaceutical technologies that are available now, is not that technically complex. You spend a lot of time sort of babysitting a beaker, making sure it stays at a certain temperature, making sure the stirring machine is going. And it's not terribly engaging work. So in the old days, what you do, of course, is you'd have a graduate student do that work for you. However, keeping temperature constants, adding reagents at particular times, stirring, all these things can be automated. And there are automated lab reactors which are out there. The problem is is they're full of proprietary technology. They are extraordinarily expensive. And they'll only be sold to you if you are a lab or you can convince the people who are selling it to you that you're a lab. But again, it's not terribly technically difficult. So we figured, why not build an open source version, get off the shelf parts. And so using some 3D printed parts, some mason jars, a Raspberry Pi Zero, some motors, a few other things, 
you can put something together that will inject reagents at particular times, hold them at temperatures, and keep stirring, and do basic reactions for you. I think that the Apothecary Micro Lab is particularly great, because it has applications beyond creating pharmaceuticals. Sure, you can make necessary drugs for yourself, and that's a powerful tool. But this could be built in makerspaces to democratize access to general lab equipment. Now, I've been to a few of your public talks recently. First at the Body Hacks Human Augmentation Conference in Austin, and then more recently at the Please Try This at Home Biotechnology Conference in Pittsburgh. Your public talks are a bit theatrical. You show what is said to be Martin Shkreli's cell phone number on one slide. <laughs> you show portions of math equations that could be in violation of the Atomic Energy Act on another. And you distribute self-made pharmaceuticals from the stage. How much of this is showmanship? Is your onstage persona a character in some ways? No, that's me. I do that sort of thing. And 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 yeah, it is a little showboaty, but but again, that's 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 me every day. Everything I say is something I genuinely believe in. All the things that I offer are genuine. Sometimes people do decry the fact that I am showy and sometimes question whether the offers that I make on stage or the things that I show are actually genuine. They are. Not that it matters a whole lot. It's not like a whole lot of people are going to call Martin Shkreli or care. So if it were a fake number, but all of those things are genuine and that's just who I am. And that's part of why I'm the spokesperson because that sort of thing comes naturally to me. I was, I was raised by talk show radio hosts, so it's fairly natural for me to enter into that sort of showy world. I mentioned there that you sometimes hand out your self-made drugs during your talks. What specifically do you hand out, and why did you choose those as opposed to other pharmaceuticals? Well, the decision-making process is the same as the decision-making process for what we decided to research and try and figure out how to make. The goal is to try to find an intersection between what is most crucial, what is most blocked access-wise, and what has the greatest level of political controversy. So handing out naloxone, for instance, which reverses opioid overdose, is a natural one because this should be over-the-counter everywhere. Everybody should have it, and everybody should carry it. It's a nasal spray. There are zero side effects. You can give it to somebody who's perfectly healthy and nothing will happen. And it works perfectly in terms of reversing opiate overdose. There's no reason that we shouldn't all have it. So handing that out is a no-brainer. And also deciding to research that so that people have access to it was, was a really easy decision. Some of the other ones get a little touchier. Uh, Mifepristone and misoprostol are the abortifacient drugs. Some people have suggested that it was reckless of me to offer those. But again, I'm of the opinion that personal choice is key. And if somebody decides they're going to take their own reproductive health into their own hands and administer their own abortion drugs, they should be able to do that. Now, granted, it's not entirely without safety. I also travel with pregnancy tests, blood pressure meters, blood oxygen monitors, all these things. So if somebody actually wanted to take that, they're able to sit and make sure that their body can handle it and that it would be a good decision. So information is key, being able to make an informed decision is key, and being able to have good data, but the decision rests in the person whose health is in question. It shouldn't be outsourced to somebody else. We all should be making our own health decisions, always. I think that you make great arguments there, but I know that there are some agencies out there that might have some issues with that sentiment. <laughs> what do you feel is the liability that you're undertaking by handing out these substances? Have you had any interactions with the FDA or law enforcement about your work? Oh, it's more than liability. I, I'm breaking a whole host of laws when I do that. And it varies depending on which state you're in. I don't know Pennsylvania's laws, but nearby is New York. And, and New York's laws for practicing medicine without a license are very strict. If you and I were sitting down and I said, oh, you know, I have a headache, and you said to me, have you thought about taking an aspirin? You technically would be in felony violation of the state law of practicing medicine without a license. 
they're written in these very broad terms so that if any prosecution wanted to be brought, there would be no ambiguity about it. So it's not just a liability. It's 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 illegal. It's genuinely illegal. These are also controlled substances. They're not available over the counter. So I'm handing out a drug that is a controlled substance. So I'm passing out illegal drugs to start with. Also, I could easily be cast in the light of practicing medicine without a license because I'm offering advice. And then, of course, there are the other things. Because I think it's so preposterous that sharing information is illegal, I also, as you mentioned before, I violate the Atomic Secrets Act on stage saying, look, here's a piece of information that we can work with. We can derive from first principles and understand something about the fundamental structure of the universe. And technically, we're violating the security of the nation of the United States. So there's a fair degree of risk involved. That said, I guess I have not been viewed as enough of a threat to get any very much, I should say, attention from um, any official organizations yet. I imagine it's just a matter of time and that eventually I will. The closest thing that has come up is that the FDA did issue a statement saying that it was not safe to build your own epinephrine auto injector, which of course is not true. But they have to say that again, because unless things are controlled, then they, of course, are, are liable. So they have to say that. But yeah, that's the closest I've had in terms of brushes with uh, official organizations. I'm glad that you brought up the atomic energy equations again, because some of the downloads hosted on the Four Thieves website include the Aaron Swartz quote, information is power. And I agree with this. Information is power, and it can be used for good purposes or nefarious purposes. In the case of you publicizing math that could be in violation of the Atomic Energy Act, you're disseminating information that could be used to design nuclear weapons. I am very conflicted about this. I think that knowledge for knowledge's sake is important, and I'm not sure that any areas of inquiry should be off limits. However, there is a difference between wanting people to have the right to explore concepts and actively disseminating information that could be used for mass destruction. What do you feel is our responsibility for stewardship of particularly dangerous information? I think everybody should have it. I think it's about as simple as that. When you use the term stewardship, it it gives me a bit of a chill because what it suggests is, is that we are gatekeepers and that we somehow are more worthy of having access to this information than other people. We're not. We're not special. We're not different. The fact that you or I or anybody else has some degree of scientific training is moot. I mean, cool. Maybe I understand how something is dangerous in a deeper way than somebody else. Maybe I have more experience handling it. That's fine. That doesn't mean that somebody else shouldn't have access because they don't have that. As soon as you take that very first step of saying, oh, oh, this is dangerous. You really shouldn't play with this until I've explained how you should use it. What you're setting up is a structure of saying, well, some of us are special and some of us should have power over the rest of you. And that very thing that you mentioned, that power through information and understanding is de facto, I I don't even want to say it's ripe for abuse. As soon as it's used, it's abuse. There's no justified use for shrouding information or from shielding people from information or understanding. The moment that we say, well, not everybody should have access to this, we've stratified power structures and it's no different than than saying, well, some people should have access to water. Some people should have access to food. Some people should have access to financial services. In fact, it's worse because having access to information and understanding is what allows people to seize access to all of those other key resources. We understand that oppression comes from resource control. Resource control comes from information control. And information control comes from the the shrouding of conceptual understanding. And as soon as that happens, as soon as that happens, as soon as the information is commodified, then 
everybody who says it's okay is guilty. Even any sort of inaction is complicity and we're part of the problem. And so as tempting as it is to say, oh, for the greater good, oh, for the safety, oh, let's make sure that we bring people into our community in a way that's safe and in welcoming, it's automatically setting up a system that's going to perpetuate that same structure of oppression. And we see that over and over again, where there's a cycle of institutionalization. And everybody's seen it. Even if you think about something as basic as a makerspace, the whole idea of a hackerspace or a makerspace is, oh, come in and play with stuff. And then eventually somebody buys a piece of equipment that maybe is like sharp or spins quickly. And somebody says, oh, well, you really should be checked out on that piece of equipment before it happens. And then eventually it develops that there are memberships that are required and there are checks that need to be done. And down the road, then it just becomes its own institution, which was the very thing the hackerspaces were designed to upset and avoid. So it's, it's a slippery slope and it's a, it's a dangerous, dangerous one. Yeah, just to clarify what I meant there, particularly with the word stewardship, what I was referring to was what you or any of us personally choose to amplify. Hmm. For example, you could have been showing a technique to desalinate seawater on that slide, which is information that could be used to save lives. But it wasn't that. <laughs> it was math that could be used to potentially make a nuclear weapon. So that's where I was getting at with the question. Sure. I don't necessarily think that facts about the nature of our universe should be shrouded, but we are all constantly making decisions about what and what not to amplify, and perhaps some things shouldn't be as amplified. Well, I don't really differentiate that, and I know that that's not a popular opinion, but the reason that I make that point with that particular equation is specifically because I don't differentiate. Looking at something like that and saying, this is information, this is something about the way the structure of the world works. And to look at an equation that describes how atoms interact in some way that leads to nuclear weapons or nuclear power or nuclear medicine, I don't see as fundamentally different than any other piece of science. People look at resultant uses of certain things and say, this isn't safe. You should think about how public you're making this. But I think that that's the exact same thing when you say, oh, well, I'm not going to barrier anybody from having access to this information, but I'm not going to tell everybody. It really it really is sort of, oh, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to light the light, but, but maybe – but maybe this darkness I cast over here, it just happens to happen because I'm standing in the way. So I, I, it's, it's very much a question of political philosophy. And I make that showboaty, somewhat absurd seeming point of saying, oh, here's an equation that would give you information about how nuclear reactions are run. Not because I think anybody needs that. It's certainly out there. But just to say it's ridiculous that there's any question about what we should have access to. That one happens to be part of my background, so you know I, I know some things about high energy physics and it's, it's, it's just silly that somebody says, oh, Michael Laufer has a degree in mathematics and theoretical physics, so it's okay for him to have it, but some kid who's curious about it, who's a high schooler shouldn't, or somebody who maybe doesn't have politics that I agree with shouldn't, or somebody who I think might be less mentally stable than I shouldn't have it. I think it's a very, very dangerous road to go down. And I think it's the one that leads to censorship. And I think it's the one that leads to classes stratification and eugenics, because we're deciding who are acceptable people to give access to eventually. I think it always goes down that road. Well, it's definitely an effective part of your public presentations. From my experience in the audience at a few of your talks, that part always gets a reaction, and it definitely makes a point. So I think it serves its purpose in that regard. And an older version of your How to Torrent a Pharmaceutical Drug talk, which you delivered at the Hope Hacker Conference in New York City in 2016, is available online. In this video, you demonstrate the last step of your process of recreating a Daraprim pill, which Martin Shkreli famously increased the price of. 
Shkreli took a compound that is available elsewhere for pennies and increased the price to $750. I think that you showing the possibility of an alternative is great. But now I'm going to take the role of one of your detractors and say that there is a difference between doing something yourself and doing something recklessly. While on stage, and you can see this in the video, you used your hands, which had been holding a microphone and operating a computer for the last half hour, to manually fill a capsule with a powder that had been sitting exposed in the room. And you said that the powder was originally clumpy and that you had used your conference badge to chop it up. A couple of times during this process, you blew on the capsule to remove the excess powder. You then offered this finished pill to the audience and handed it off to another conference attendee to pass back to the person who wanted it. Some might say that this was reckless, and simple safety and cleanliness guidelines that could have been followed were needlessly overlooked. What is your response to this? Well, um... I think it would have been a very different thing if I were dealing with some sort of biological compound where sterility was really key. Daraprim's an anti-parasitic, so it's a very blunt tool, uh, chemically speaking. And so it, it's not something that needed a lot of delicacy. And in that case, again, it, the theatricality of, of showing it being done and the fact that, you know, I wasn't doing it in a clean room and, yeah, you know, things may have fluttered into it. Uh, yeah, sure. But, you know, everybody saw that happen live and they were able to make their own decision to say, OK, well, look, I saw him handling it, so I'm not going to take that. Again, it's it's a matter of personal agency and personal opinion. If if somebody decides they're going to make their own Daraprim, they're going to make their own decision as to how clean they want to make their practices. Are they going to sit there and convert their garage into a level six clean room and make sure that everything's isolated? Or do they decide, okay, look, I have HIV and I'm worried about toxoplasmosis and I need to make this drug and I'm already dying. So really how much worse can it be? I'm going to try anything. And again, it comes down to the importance of having a personal choice. If somebody doesn't work extra legally in these cases and they don't have access to life-saving medications, the only thing that is left as an option is to just shrug and wait to die. And if you're dying of something, really, what's the worst that could happen? You try and make something and it doesn't work? Well, you're already dying. It's not like it got worse. So, Again, recklessness is a personal measure that I think is there for everyone to make. And the goal that I am always working toward is to try and get people toward a point of empowerment where they're ready to say, I'm going to make a decision. And whether that decision is, I'm never buying any drug unless it came from a factory and was given to me by a pharmacist because I had a prescription from a board certified doctor who's a specialist in the area where I have my ailment. Okay. Or if that decision is I'm not going to consult anybody, I'm going to read up and I'm going to decide that I'm going to be my own expert and I'm going to manufacture my own medical technology, be it hardware or pharmaceuticals or whatever else. And I'm going to seize the technology that's on the shelf and make it, then great. But again, the importance is the differentiation between having decisions made for you because the infrastructure says, oh, you're not smart enough to make decisions for yourself and saying, I'm going to decide how my health is being handled. And I really don't care if somebody says that they think that they're smarter than I am and I shouldn't be making my own decisions. Most of your work has been focused on democratizing access to pharmaceuticals that are used for therapeutic or medicinal purposes. It can sometimes make sense to take additional risks when you're hoping to treat something that is already wrong, but what are your thoughts on elective procedures for augmentative purposes? What are your thoughts on human enhancement? I think it's great. I don't really see a difference. I think that using drugs therapeutically is human enhancement. If people are genuine purists and say, oh, you know, you, you shouldn't be messing with your biology, well, then, then, then fine. Die of the flu, you know? Go ahead. 
don't don't get your flu shot don't take aspirin just just decide that nature's going to sort itself out and if if you've been chosen to not survive that's just natural selection and i think that the interplay between human enhancement as it's called and therapeutics is wonderful there's a brilliant guy named Joey Wong who runs a company that uses nootropics that specifically can help people who are on the autism spectrum function better. These were designed for human enhancement and now they're therapeutic. But again, I don't really see a difference. You want to think better? Does it really matter if you think well to start with or you have trouble thinking? Better's better. If you want to adjust your biology in that way, you should totally have access to it. Again, looking at people who are these bio artists, people like Stellark when he built his third arm, I think it's wonderful. Why not? If we have ways to make ourselves different, we should. And I think also it really helps in the anti-ableism movement because now when you look at somebody with a prosthesis, it's not, oh, you poor thing, it's so cool that you're making do <laughs> despite your disability, but instead it's, oh, you made a choice to utilize a machine to enhance your biology. I think that's spectacular. I think that that's a great answer and a new perspective on this. And I know Joey Wong as well and can confirm that he's doing some very interesting things. You're currently a college math professor, and I've seen you quoted as saying, many students think they can't learn math. The truth is, most of them have just never been shown the beauty of what math really is. I think that's a great quote, and it resonates personally with me. I'd love to hear your pitch for this. What is the beauty of math, and how would you describe it? Well, the beauty of math is that there are patterns everywhere in nature, and we have logical capacity in our thought processes. And every moment of every day, we are observing those patterns and utilizing those logical processes in our brains to analyze those patterns. We don't think about it a lot because it's automatic. But when you go from home to work, you pick a particular route. You optimize. You do that automatically. Your brain does it. When you're having a discussion with somebody and you're trying to explain what you think, you're using logic to form your argument. We have a system of bookkeeping in mathematics that makes some of that a little more efficient. And because it's fraught with fancy symbols and fancy nomenclature, it often scares people off. But the real beauty is that as soon as you see a pattern, it's a toy. If you see the pattern, you can manipulate it, and then you can interact with your world in an active way instead of merely saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen next, but you'll be able to predict things, and you can be able to adjust things so that outcomes are more of what you'd like, whether you're playing a game of backgammon or chess or whether you're just driving to work, and that's accessible to everybody because it's not really – that complicated. It's just a matter of garnering a new perspective, just like learning a new language or, or reading Shakespeare. It offers a new set of perspectives. And when you have that, it makes life richer. I just wish someone could have explained math to me in that way when I was in middle school. I was good at it, but I never really applied myself. And hearing something like that would have made a huge difference. So thank you for spreading the word about that. Now, we've talked a lot about citizen science here, so I'd love to know, what is your vision for how you would like to see the future of this play out, and how do you think it's actually likely to play out? I'd like the term citizen science to vanish, and I'd like it to vanish because people are practicing science so commonly that it's a non-topic. You know, we don't say citizen chefs for people who cook at home. We don't say citizen vocalists for people who sing in the shower. 
And similarly, I don't think we should say citizen scientists for people who utilize science, which is a universal tool, something that really is every human's birthright outside an institution that that grants them some sort of a degree saying they have a sufficient understanding of it, as has been shown through testing techniques. I'm hoping citizen science becomes so common the phrase falls out of use. In terms of how that will play out, I don't know. I think that there is a really unfortunate stigma against trying things without training. But I hope that that continues to get broken down in every sphere, everything from cooking to science to music, and that people see fewer and fewer barriers between themselves and things that they'd like to try. I've always used the term citizen science as a positive thing, and I felt that it was useful, but you make some great points there. Maybe I'll reconsider that. Is there anything you can point to, could be books, experiences, anything really, that has influenced you greatly or inspired you? I think you have a very interesting worldview, and I'd like to get some idea of where that comes from, and give the audience the opportunity to explore that for themselves. I think it's it's good to look historically at two things. First off, anything that's being done by human beings, even if it's institutionalized, was originally first done by one person. Somebody tried it for the very first time, and they didn't know it was going to happen. Everything from the atomic bomb to making rubber. And if you look into the history of anything that you're interested in, and you dig up the first instances of when it was done, you can see that it was just somebody who was trying stuff. If you look at the Montgolfier brothers when they went up in their first balloon, they were just trying stuff. Any number of scientific discoveries can be traced back to their roots. And when you look at the first attempt, it was just somebody. And they're not any different than you or I. And so that's accessible. The other thing to look at that I find inspiring are instances of times when people have moved outside of official channels and worked extra legally to try to make things happen. If you look at Gandhi's life as he decided to intentionally break the law, being a lawyer working to intentionally break the law as not just a form of protest, but something to show that small acts of resistance can actually bring about great change. And to look at guerrilla movements, the sort of idea that you can use your weaknesses as strengths. When you look at a behemoth like the pharmaceutical industry, could you ever take them on and fight them in a pitched battle? Well, of course not. But what can you do that they can't? Well, they have to build a factory and have to have quality controls and they have to work with the FDA every time they want to build a drug. I know that there's somebody out there who's going to develop the new drug it's going to save something amazing. It's going to be a cure for some disease that we have nothing to help with. And it's going to come out of their basement because somebody was unafraid to experiment. So those are things that I'd look for always. Look for things – look for places where people did things first. Look for places where people didn't ask permission. And look for places where people try to use their weaknesses as strengths. And you'll always find a way to do whatever you need. I think that that's a great place to end this. Now, now, for people in the audience who would like to get involved or would like to find out more about you and follow along with your work, where would you send them? Um, you can go to fourthievesvinegar.org. If you're cagey about security, we also have an Onion site that's accessible on the Tor network. If you want to get involved with what we're doing, we have a contact page on the website, and you can just write to us. And... More than getting involved with what we're doing, which of course we could use the help, and if you're out there and you're interested in helping, please do get in touch. I hope that people start getting involved in their own projects and the thing that they think, oh gosh, wouldn't it be nice if I could, but I'm not sure if I can. Just go out and try. Perfect. I'll put links to these resources in the show notes at futuregrind.org. And Michael, thank you again for speaking with me. I think that this was an important conversation, and I'm glad that we had it. Me too. Thanks again, and let's talk again soon. 
Hey everyone, Ryan O'Shea again, and thanks for listening to my interview with Michael Lawfer. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe. You can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. Once again, the thoughts of the guests on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Future Grind or myself. In this episode, we discuss the production and potential use of homemade pharmaceuticals. Ingesting any of these compounds should be considered extremely dangerous, and things can go wrong. I advise consulting with a trained medical doctor and seeking expert opinions before taking your health care into your own hands. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Future Grind.